Eli Manning had a historic NFL career. From going first overall in the draft to beating arguably the greatest team of all time on the biggest stage, he's done it all. Somehow, despite the multiple Super Bowl MVPs, four Pro Bowls, and being a top 10 passer of all time, he still feels underappreciated sometimes. So with that said, I wanted to shed some light on one of the more overlooked seasons of all time. Entering 2011, Eli had been in the league for seven seasons, and for the most part, had lived up to the hype of being the number one overall pick, and having the Manning last name of course. New York was now four years removed from their improbable Super Bowl win in 2007, the third in the franchise's history. The previous few years ended in disappointment, especially the 2010 season, where Manning had a league-high 25 interceptions. That 2010 season also included the Miracle at the Meadowlands Part 2, a game where if the Giants had won, they more than likely would have made the playoffs for the fifth time in six years. As we know, New York blew a 31-10 lead in the fourth quarter, Deshaun Jackson pulled off a miracle, and the Eagles stole the division crown. 2011 was more than just any other season for the Giants. They were looking for revenge after a heartbreak season the year prior. Before even taking the field, Eli Manning, who was monotone and never outspoken, had a quote in early August that really had New Yorkers talking. While on the radio with Mike Michael K, Eli was asked if he believed he was an elite quarterback and should be in the same class as Tom Brady. To which Manning replied, I consider myself in that class. Manning also touched on last season's disappointing stats and assured it would not happen again. I'm not a 25 interception quarterback. I know that. That's going to be fixed and it should be a good year. It was time for Eli to stand on business, as the kids say. The state of the Giants receiving core heading into the 2011 season was not high thought of. They had a young Hakeem Nix entering his prime coming off his first 1,000 yard season, but behind him were a bunch of question marks. Could Mario Manningham, who had been the team's wide receiver 3, thrive as the wide receiver 2? With the departure of Steve Smith, who was once a favorite target of Eli, rumors swirled in the offseason about Plaxico Burris returning to the Giants, but Plaxico, who had just gotten out of prison, took his talents to the other team in New York. The wide receiver 3 spot for the G-Men was up in the air. Names like Dominique Hickson, a veteran who had been more known for his kick returning was a possibility, or even Jarrell Jernigan, a rookie third round pick. Those concerns were reassured on the first drive of the season when a Giants wide receiver three dropped an easy pass on third and eight. That wide receiver was undrafted free agent Victor Cruz but there's more on him later. The opening game did not go well. The Giants lost by two touchdowns and Eli threw an interception. The Giants did bounce back though and won their next three games. One of those games was the breakout game of Victor Cruz, who hauled in two touchdowns and 110 yards at Philadelphia. The following week at Arizona is when you really started to believe there was something magical about this Giants team. With under four minutes to go, the Giants found themselves down by 10, but Eli Manning, who always looked unfazed erased that deficit in under two minutes. Manning's two touchdown passes in the final four minutes gave the Giants enough to escape Arizona with a 31-27 victory. The next three wins brought more late game Eli magic. After being down 14-3 to Miami, they came back and a go-ahead fourth quarter touchdown pass to Victor Cruz was the difference. Manning was never perfect, but when the stakes were the highest, he always performed at an elite level. He would do the same thing a week later against against Buffalo leading a go-ahead field goal drive, and the Giants defense did the rest. But his week nine comeback victory at New England was probably the most impressive win of the season. When Brady found Gronk to go up four with one minute and 36 seconds to go, it looked like New England was in a great position to win the game. Eli and his offense had to go 80 yards on the road to win their third straight game and improve to six and two. The Giants got stuck in a third and 10 on their own 39. When Eli threw a strike up the seam to tight end Jake Ballard for a 28-yard gain. Ballard pretty much caught the ball against his helmet, which was very reminiscent of the David Tyree catch four years prior in Super Bowl 42. Ballard and Tyree ironically wore the same number. A Victor Cruz pass interference in the end zone gave the Giants the ball at the one-yard line, and the drive was capped off with a Jake Ballard touchdown, giving the Giants a three-point lead and the win with just 15 seconds remaining. Manning's come-from-behind win at New England would end up foreshadowing future events, but we'll get to that later. New York's last four wins all came on fourth quarter comebacks, and once again, 
it really felt like a magical season was in the works. Although they were 6-2, and two, there was still a ton of football left to be played. Manning to that point was putting up a really solid season, including 15 touchdowns and a 98 passer rating. But just like the season prior in 2010, the team started to collapse. From weeks 10 through 13, the Giants lost four straight games, and the attention was now on Tom Coughlin, who the media speculated could be on the hot seat with another late season collapse in back-to-back -back years. Week 14 at Dallas was a must-win game. It was Sunday night football, the Giants were one game back of the Dallas Cowboys, and a loss here would pretty much put an end to their season. When Tony Romo found Des Bryant on a busted coverage to go up 34-22, and just five minutes remaining, it felt likely that the Giants would lose their fifth straight game and all but be eliminated from NFC East contention. On third and one down two scores, Manning threw up a prayer off his back foot to Victor Cruz, who came down with the ball for a big first down. Manning later found Jake Ballard for an eight-yard touchdown, putting the Giants back down by five. The defense, though, still needed a stop, and on third and five and Miles Austin running wide open, it looked as if Dallas had this game wrapped up. However, Tony Romo inexplicably overshot him, giving NYG a chance to win the game in the final two minutes. Luckily for the Giants, they were no stranger to these moments, and neither was their quarterback. Eli found that man again, Jake Ballard, for a 20-yard gain, getting the ball into Dallas territory. After Mario Manningham dropped a perfect pass that would have resulted in a 24-yard touchdown, the Giants' hopes for saving their season were dwindling. That was until the UDFA sensation Jake Ballard hauled in another 18-yard catch to put the Giants at the one-yard line. By the way, what the hell was Dallas doing sending two pass rushers in an obvious passing situation? The Giants took the lead to go up by three, but Romo and the Cowboys got back in field goal range to potentially tie the game. But Jason Pierre-Paul, who was in the midst of a breakout season, blocked the kick. This thrilling comeback win completely changed the Giants' season, and they rode that momentum for the rest of the way. Except for the following week versus Washington when they lost by two scores and Eli had three interceptions, in probably his worst game of the season. But the good news for the Giants was that Eli Manning would be surgical for the rest of the way. They sat at 7-7 seven and seven with two games remaining, needing to win both to make the playoffs. And in order to do that, they had to beat two of their rivals, the New York Jets and the Dallas Cowboys. In the Christmas Eve matchup versus the Jets, Eli only completed nine passes. Now hearing that, you'd probably think that the Giants lost and their season was over. However, one of those nine completions was a 99-yarder to Victor Cruz right before halftime, which set the tone for the second half. Manning against a very good Jets defense that had Darrell Revis and Antonio Cromartie passed for 225 yards and a touchdown. This meant that the final week of the season was a win or go home matchup versus the Cowboys. As we know, when the lights were bright, number 10 was going to show up. And of course he did, throwing for three touchdowns and 346 yards with no turnovers. The Giants won pretty comfortably, meaning they won the NFC East and got to host a playoff game in the wild card round. With the 2011 regular season over, Eli's stats were in the books. He threw for a career high 4,933 passing yards, had a touchdown to interception ratio of 29 to 16, 8.4 yards per attempt, which ranked fourth in the NFL, a 92 passer rating, and in no surprise, he led the league in fourth quarter comebacks and game winning drives. But honestly, one of the more impressive aspects to Eli Manning's 2011 season was the lack of help he was getting around him. Pro Football Focus ranked the Giants offensive line 31st in the NFL and dead last in pass blocking. Left tackle Will Beatty missed the final six games, David Deal and Chris Snee were older and declining, and starting center David Boss missed five games. On top of one of the worst Lions in the league, the Giants also had a terrible rushing attack on the season. Brandon Jacobs and Ahmad Bradshaw obviously had their moments, but the numbers don't lie. The Giants were last in the NFL in rushing yards, last in yards per carry, and last in explosive runs in the NFL that year. And remember, the Giants receiving core had major questions coming into the season aside from Hakeem Nix. It took undrafted free agents Victor Cruz and Jake Ballard combining for over 2,100 yards to barely sneak into the playoffs. But our story here is far from over. Manning went into the playoffs on a heater and that did not stop. The Giants stomped the Falcons in the wildcard rounds as Eli threw for 277 yards, three touchdowns, and completed over 70% of his passes with no 
no turnovers. The divisional round though was quite the test as they had to travel to Green Bay to face the defending champion Packers coming off a 15-1 regular season. It may have been below freezing but the Giants offense was hot. Eli had two long touchdown passes in the first half to Hakeem Nicks including a 37-yard Hail Mary pass as time expired. Manning had one more touchdown pass in the fourth quarter and the Giants stunned the Packers, a Packers team that was arguably the best roster in football that year. The NFC Championship was not much easier. The Giants had to go on the road to Candlestick Park and play the 49ers who boasted a top 5 defense that season. This game, despite the two Super Bowls, probably went down as Eli Manning's most iconic game as a Giant, and many Giants fans would say the same thing. Before even summarizing the performance, I have to mention this. Manning was sacked 6 times in this game and the 49ers hit him 12 other times. There was even a quote by Giants defensive end Justin Tuck of him telling the Giants backup quarterback David Carr to start warming up, because Eli was visibly taking a beating out there. Due to the 49ers stout run defense and the Giants inefficiency running the ball, Eli threw the ball 58 times in that game. It was even raining that night which made the performance even more impressive. Manning ended up throwing for 2 touchdowns and 316 yards, with no turnovers, against the NFC's top to ranked defense. Again, he delivered in the clutch, on 3rd and 15, throwing a laser to Mario Manningham in the middle of the 4th quarter to take the lead. His best play of the game did end up resulting in a scoreless drive, but Eli had an amazing throw down the left sideline to Ahmad Bradshaw, waiting till the very last second before getting crushed by 3 Niners defenders. Thanks to some special teams help, the Giants kicked a game winning field goal in overtime and made their way to Super Bowl 46. After taking an extraordinary amount of hits, Manning now had two weeks to prepare for another Super Bowl matchup versus the New England Patriots. The Patriots may have possessed the most successful head coach and quarterback duo of all time, but that never really seemed to phase Eli. To that point in his career versus the Pats, Eli was 2-1, and, and that one loss, he put up 35 points and 4 passing touchdowns. In the first quarter, Eli found Victor Cruz on a pass that zipped right past the ear of Gerard Mayo, yeah that guy, and the Giants got out to a quick lead. The Giants offense had to settle for field goals for most of the day, but just like it was scripted in Hollywood, Eli Manning got the ball down two with under four minutes remaining. A similar situation he found himself in week nine in Foxborough and in Super Bowl 42 four years prior. On the first play of the drive, Eli stepped up in the pocket and delivered what some fans would say was the greatest throw of Manning's career, especially given the circumstances. He stepped up in the pocket and heaved up a pass down the left sideline to Mario Manningham, who with tremendous this concentration hauled in a 38-yard reception to start the drive. The rest of that drive relied on Eli's right arm, as he hit Manningham for another first down and Hakeem Nicks for two more. Whether they were supposed to score or not, Ahmad Bradshaw did land in the end zone, putting the Giants up by four. A Hail Mary attempt by Brady fell incomplete, and the Giants won Super Bowl 46, their second in a four-year span. In the playoffs, Eli threw for nine touchdowns and only one turnover, and a quarterback rating of 103. He was magnificent and won the Super Bowl MVP for the second time in his career. Although Aaron Rodgers won regular season MVP, the case can be made that Eli Manning had the best overall season of any player in 2011. If you add in the circumstances, the comebacks, the underperforming linemen and run game, the clutch playoff wins and being the last team standing, it really does not get much better. But then again, it's hard to vote against a guy who had 45 touchdowns to 6 interceptions on a 15-1 team. Eli ranked 6th in comeback player of the year voting coming off his down 2010 season where he led the league in interceptions. Unfortunately, Manning and the Giants never got back to the Super Bowl, and he actually only played in just one more playoff game the rest of his career before his retirement after the 2019 season. He may not go down as the best quarterback to ever play the game, but there's very few, if any, that you would take over Eli when trailing by a touchdown and under two minutes to go. That's going to do it for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Of course, leave a like and subscribe if you did, and I will talk to you guys next time. Time.